Hello and welcome to an oral and maxillofacial surgery preview. I'm Mark Sowers. Today, as we usually do, we're going to start by discussing the anatomy of the oral and maxillofacial areas. And I'm going to give you a little hint here. Here's a secret. Okay, there are not that many surgeries that are involved in this particular area. So if you're taking a test, you might see a lot of the questions are actually going to come from anatomy. So knowing your anatomy in this particular chapter is really going to help you out. As children, we have 20 teeth, these baby teeth. We have 20 of them. And of course, we lose them. They fall out to make room for the adult teeth that will grow in later. And we have 32 of those normally. Now, many people like me, I only have 24 because I've had four bicuspids removed and four molars removed. So removing teeth to make room for other teeth is kind of a normal thing in Western societies. So you're going to see a lot of that. But naturally, we generally have 32 adult teeth. Up front, we have incisors that cut through the food. We have cuspids, which have a single point. We have bicuspids, which have two points. And then in the back, we have molars, which have four or so points on them. Just like with the body, we have directional terms. Well, when we're talking about the mouth and when we're talking about teeth, we have directional terms here as well. The inside surface of the teeth is known as the lingual side, meaning the tongue, the tongue side or the lingual side of the teeth. The outside surface of the teeth is known as the facial side. So that's where it's pointing out towards the face. And the facial is actually divided up into two sections. We have the labial side, which means labial meaning lips. So the lip side versus further back, the buccal side, buccal meaning the cheeks. Each tooth has three general areas. We have the crown, which is the exposed portion of the tooth. We have the neck, which was just sort of a little narrowing that fits right at the edge of the gums. And then we have the root that actually goes down into the bone and that holds the tooth in place. Surrounding the crown, we have the enamel. That's the white hard stuff of the tooth. A little bit deeper under the enamel, we have dentin, which is a somewhat softer material. And then filling the center of the tooth, we have a pulp cavity, which contains blood vessels and nerves that helps to feed the tooth. The skull itself is made up of many different bones, most of which are sort of fused together. Their joints don't really move very much or at all. But knowing the different bones and where they are in the skull, I think, is going to be very important in this chapter. Starting in the very front, the forehead area of the skull, that's the frontal bone. Coming down to the sides, the cheekbones are the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone makes up most of the cheekbones. Right around and under the nose, we have the maxilla bone. And notice that the maxilla bone has what's called a zygomatic process. So a process is a little extension of a bone that goes somewhere else. So normally you have the regular bone and then you have a little process that sort of sticks out of that bone. So the maxilla bone has a zygomatic process and it's called that because it reaches out, it extends to the zygomatic bone. So we have the zygomatic process of the maxilla bone. We also have a zygomatic process of the temporal bone, which is the bone on the side of the skull that reaches into the zygomatic bone from the other direction, not to get the, the two confused. Now, another process of the maxilla bone is known as the alveolar process. And this is actually an extension of the maxilla bone that goes down around the teeth. It's what holds the teeth in place. And it actually sort of thins out a little bit before it gets wide over the teeth. That's why it's known as a process. So the alveolar process of the maxilla bone is what holds the teeth in place. The one bone in the skull that actually does articulate, that does move, is the mandible. And this is the bone that moves up and down as you chew or as you speak. Notice these two little holes here in the mandible. These are known as the mental foramen. Now, foramen means a hole or an opening in the bone. And in this case, mental, we're talking about the chin. So mental is a medical term for chin. All right, so these mental foramen, what they do is they allow nerves and blood vessels to come through the bone and reach the skin of the chin. A little bit deeper in the skull, in the eyeball area, we have the ethmoid bone. And then a little deeper still, we find the sphenoid bone. Now, as I mentioned before, the mandible is really the only bone in the skull or the head that really moves or articulates a whole lot. So the joint 
where the mandible meets the temporal bone, we discussed this briefly in the previous lecture, is the temporomandibular joint, or the TMJ. Parts of the mandible that lead to the TMJ actually have specific names. The large part that scoops upward towards the temporal bone, that's called the ramus. And then there's a small protrusion that comes out of the ramus, and that's known as the condyle. So let's take a look at a few of the surgeries that would be performed in an oral and maxillofacial surgery center. An odontectomy, again, ectomy is the removal of something. In this case, odont, we're referring to the teeth. So this is simply the removal of teeth or the tooth extraction. Except in extreme cases, this is often done under local anesthesia. Most of the time when we're talking about broken bones of the face, we're talking about traumatic injuries that happen to the patient. Now, this could be something like a car accident or something like that, but often broken bones in the face area are caused by aggressive behavior, either by punching or by hitting another person in the face with an object. So to repair broken bones in the face, in this case in the mandible, we're going to use something called plates. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the broken bone and put it together as closely together, back together as possible. That's reducing the gap. We're reducing the fracture or the break. Okay, we're reducing the space in between those two bones. And then we're going to hold it in place with plates, which are these little pieces of metal that we're going to then screw into the bone that's going to hold that fracture and that break together. And because pretty much every fracture or every break in the facial bones are different, we have lots of different plates to choose from. And you can see a few of those examples here. And notice there's some long ones, some wide ones, heavier, thick ones, some thinner ones, depending on where that break might occur and whatever the doctor is going to use in order to try to reduce and fix that break. Notice also that these come in all different shapes. There's shapes that look like different letters. There's L shapes here, and you can see a Y shape or an X shape or even an H shape. Over here, we have some T-shaped plates. So the doctor will sometimes ask for different plates that look like these different letters. And once we've got the fracture reduced and fixed with the plates, we don't want the patient to then start to use their mouth and their jaw, and that's kind of common because people want to eat, right? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to fix the jaw in place so that the patient can't use it very easily at all. And we're going to do that by using something called arch bars. Now, arch bars are a little strip of metal. You can see them here, have these little hooks. It sort of reminds me of the hooks that you see on the back of a bra. I don't know. That's what it reminds me of anyway. And you'll cut these arch bars to the right length and extend them across the teeth. And then we're going to use wire to wrap around the tooth and around the arch bar and sort of twist it into place to hold that arch bar on the teeth. Now, here we've done it for the bottom teeth, and we're going to do exactly the same thing across the upper teeth, the top teeth as well. And what these little hooks, these little bra hooks are for, is we're going to take a wire and run it up and down from the one arch bar to the next, holding the two arch bars tightly together, holding the teeth, holding the mouth very tightly together so that the patient can't move it while that bone is healing. And of course, with their mouth fixed like this, they're going to have difficulty eating, so they'll often use a straw or using liquid nutrients to get their food for several days or weeks that way. Now, occasionally when we send patients back to the recovery room after they've had their surgery, after they've had their arch bars installed and their mouth fixed closed, like you see here, sometimes patients, as they wake up from anesthesia, they have some problems and maybe the anesthesiologist has to get in there and, and open up an airway. And it's going to be difficult to do that with these wires in place holding the jaw shut. So we will always send a patient back to the recovery room, back to pack you with a pair of wire cutters. So if there is an emergency and the doctors need to get into the mouth and open the airway very quickly, they can do so with these wire cutters. An orbital floor fracture, in this case we're talking about a very thin piece of bone that sits right under the eyeball and above the maxillary sinus. It's very thin, it's very easy to break, especially if somebody gets hit in the eye area. And of course, if this bone breaks, it's going to cause the support for the eyeball to fail, and the eyeball can sort of dip down a little bit as you see here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in, and it's going to be hard to actually repair this bone and sort of put it back together because it's so fine. So we're usually going to take some piece of artificial material and place it in there to support the eyeball back into place. 
Often this might look like a piece of mesh or a piece of wire, as you see here, placed in the eye socket supporting the eye. But then the eye itself sort of moving around on this wire mesh might get a little stuck. It might be a little rough. So we might cover it with a piece of silastic material. Now, silastic is a word you're going to hear fairly often in surgery. So let me explain exactly what we're talking about. Silastic is a brand name for silicone rubber. It's silicone, so it's completely inert. It doesn't break down in the body. It's going to stay in place for a very long time. So silastic can often come in sheets. And in this case, we have a thin sheet of silastic material here that we place over that grate so that we have a nice smooth surface for the eyeball to rub against. But silastic, silicone rubber, can be used in many different places. Here we have a couple of different pre-cut pieces of silastic sheeting. And even other prostheses can be made out of this silastic, the silicone rubber material. And you see a few of those here. These can be implants, or even in this case, we have a joint in the bone that we've removed the joint and replaced it with this silastic material. So when you hear the word silastic, understand that that's a brand name. We're talking about silicone rubber. And when we talk about facial fractures, fra fractures of the facial bone, there's really three types that we see fairly often. And these are known as Lefort fractures. So in this case, we have a break in the maxilla bone. The maxilla bone being the bone just under and around the nose. And in this case, the alveolar process, again, that little extension of the maxilla bone that holds the teeth, that part has broken away. So a Lefort one is when the alveolar process breaks away from the rest of the maxillary bone. A Lefort II fracture is a little bit higher in the face. Now, in this case, the entire maxillary bone has broken away from its other connecting bones, from the zygomatic bone. So the breaks sort of go upward around the nose and along that line that separates the zygomatic bone from the maxillary bone. This is a Lefort II fracture. Then a fracture even higher in the face involves both the maxillary bone, which you can see here in the front, and the zygomatic bone, the cheekbones. So these two bones stay attached together, but then they break away from the rest of the skull. So a Lefort III involves the maxillary and the zygomatic bones breaking away from the rest of the skull. So Lefort I, lower, Lefort II comes up a little bit, and Lefort III is right across the eyes here, breaking two of those large bones away. Knowing the difference between those three types of Lefort fractures is going to be important. And again, looking back at the anatomy of the skull, you can see where those breaks might occur. The first one, the alveolar process would be break, broken off. That's a Lefort I. The second one, the entire green bone that you see here, the entire maxilla, is breaks away. That's Lefort II. And then when you have the green and the orange, the maxilla and the zygomatic bones, both of those break away. That's now a Lefort III. But every fracture is a little bit different, and sometimes these fractures can be rather extreme. And in this case, the surgeon is going to spend a lot of time figuring out exactly how to put these facial bones back together. Sometimes this may require many different plates and extensive surgery, and of course, the arch bars holding the jaw in place so that the patient doesn't move it around. So that's it for oral and maxillofacial surgery. This is again a short chapter, so really, know your anatomy.